All right, we are joined today by one of TV's funniest writers and producers. If you are a fan of laughing at your television, you have most certainly seen his name. Brad Copeland has worked on Arrested Development. My name is Earl, The Inbetweeners, and Life in Pieces, as well as wrote and directed the film of this episode, Coffee Town. Uh, plus, so much more, so let's get into it. Yes, thank you so much. And again, before we get right into, of course, uh, again, as he said, your career is We've seen it, like I say, it's been a part of our childhood, our adolescence, and our adulthood, apparently. Uh, but from what we looked at, before we dive into Coffee Town, we were doing some research online. Um, and we wanted to confirm something. We saw that, of course, one of my favorite childhood things in the world, that it's a possibility, rumor, non-disclosure, G14 classified thing, saying that, of course, you're going to be writing um, on the, the version of the movie Night Rider. Are you allowed to discuss that? And pl Just please tell me it's happening. Make my dreams come true. Sure. I can tell you, you want the good news or the bad news? <laughs> it, uh, uh, I, did, I did write it. Uh, I did write it. It was great. I don't think they're going to make my version of it. Uh, and the problem is my version of it was developed uh, by a man you might have heard of named Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. so who's, Harvey, no, who's that? <laughs> yeah. So Harvey, Harvey, brought, Harvey had bought the rights. Um, of a Glenn Larson, you know, who passed away a couple of years ago, the creative night writer. And Harvey brought me in and I had never met him before and he was insane. And we, I, I wrote that version of Knight Rider and it was really special. It is really special. And then when everything went south for Harvey, uh, no one wants to touch anything that he had anything to do with. So my script still exists. Uh, it's at Spyglass but I think they're trying to turn it into a different type of movie uh, because of that. But my version is very uh, eastbound and down kind of comedy night writer. -y. I think they're trying to go kind of the fast and furious hardcore drama with it, yeah. which is not really what I was into. You know, my, yeah. my version, the, the version I pitched now, I think I was working on eastbound and down at the time was like the trailer I pitched to them was the, uh, you just see kit, you just see this car, and the car itself is talking about all, all the possibilities it can do and all this technology and all these, these things. And, you know, and out of the smoke comes Michael Knight and it's Danny McBride. And the car says, are you fucking kidding me? And then you just cut to the Knight Rider scene. You know what I mean? So that was, it was really about a buddy comedy with, with him in the car. Um, so you just, you know, it's a weird town. You never know. It could swing back and, uh, you know, cause you just never know. Maybe yeah, so maybe they'll yeah. adopt that for the remake of the remake. For the reboot. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Literally the exactly. reboot. Ah, that that sucks. That, that that I'm I'm sold by that trailer. I would have loved to see Danny McBride pull that <laughs> off. That would have been it's fantastic. Cool, Let me ask a quick question. Uh, obviously you've wrote working on scripts before and everything just as actors have their scenes hit the cutting room floor. Sometimes a script, like you say, doesn't come out and of course they can come around to it again. But how does that make you feel as someone to you put in this time and work on a script and, and it you just can't just put it on the refrigerator. Like, what do you do? Do you feel like it's a child that was never born or you just hope one day someone sees it? How does that work? You know, it, it's, it depends on the script. Sometimes it's brutal. Sometimes it really just, you go into a depression. Um, sometimes like like in a situation, even like Knight Rider, I'm like, well, the the value of the script, I, I, I got a lot of value out of it because because the script was so good that a lot of people read it and it uh, opened up an avenue of other jobs because it was the first kind of lethal weapon toned movie I had written, you know, they were, they were, I mean, it had big budget action stuff, or whatever. So it's like, you don't get completely devastated. Uh, but, and then there's things that I love that just, I, the first movie I ever wrote was called Corporate Retreat. Uh, and I wrote it when I was a writer on Arrested Development and that one didn't get made. And then it was stolen. I'll give you, you give you breaking news. <laughs> that movie was stolen by Vince Vaughn um, and, and uh, made into couples retreat. Uh, and stolen in that, I, I met with him to be in it and because I was going to direct it and uh, didn't want to direct it with him in it. And then two months later, he pitched an idea called couples retreat that was based wow. in the same location with the same scenes and the same stuff. Um, that was horrible that, I mean, that, that you, when I saw the couples retreat posters in the theater, it was the worst feeling in the world. So it just goes back and forth, but then like this, things have a way of coming. The, the movie I wrote for Disney plus that's coming out in January. Uh, hopefully <laughs> Disney plus is weird. They don't tell us the official dates. 
Um, that yeah. movie, well, Flora and Ulysses, is based off of a, a book called Flora and Ulysses by Kate DiCamillo, who did Tales of Despero and stuff. Um, that sat for two years. It just sat like it was too weird. It's about a squirrel and it, you know, that, that writes poetry and it's cost $60 million to make. And then all of a sudden, Disney Plus read it and just said, this is exactly the kind of movie we want to make. It's a big, big family comedy. And then boom, it was like, I went in there and they're like, hey, we're shooting this in three months. Can you be in Vancouver? So you just never know. It's, it's, a, it's a weird town, you guys. <laughs> so it can get stole or it can get sold. Just be ready for it. Exactly. Okay. 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 Yeah. Or Weinstein. Yeah. The, the trick is that it's, it's advice. I mean, it's advice for you guys or for anybody that's in the creative world. Just have multiple plates spinning. And if you can do, if you can have more than one thing going that you care about, then it doesn't hurt when one thing goes down because at least there's something else that has some momentum. You know what I mean? So, so we need to start a uh, on change.org petition for for the real Knight Rider. Oh yeah, the real one, the one we want to see. Yeah. The, the... <laughs> yes. There you go. Start it. Get it going. We're going all the way back, uh, 1999. Where from as far as I could tell, it looks like you kind of got your start as far as IMDb credits go, I guess. Um, News Radio, where you served as a uh, script coordinator and were credited for the story on the episode Freaky Friday. When did you realize you had a gift for writing comedy, which you absolutely do? And and when did you decide it was something that you wanted to pursue? I think it was college. Uh, You know, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I grew up in Orlando, Florida. and I had kind of a pen pal relationship with a cartoonist, Jake Vest, that worked there. Uh, and uh, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to be Bill Watterson. Um, and somewhere along the way in college, this would be like late 90s, 98, at University of Florida, uh, I realized that that's a really narrow road. Like you can't, you know, you have to get a syndic- you know, syndication and all. And it's just like, basically, you have to be the greatest uh, cartoonist in the world to bump Kathy or Garfield, you know, all these things that have been there for generations that these literally cartoons are passing on to their kids and stuff uh, to write. So I'm like, how else, what else can I do? Like, I just want to write funny stuff. Um, In my senior year of college, uh, I got a, well, first of all, in college, I was writing a humor column for the news, for the college newspaper, community college in Ocala. Uh, And, uh, and then I became David Letterman's intern, the senior, my senior year of college. So I went to New York and that was like a one in a million chance um, of just writing, inter- applying for internships. And I couldn't believe I got it. And I went out there and met and they, they, they brought me on. That was really where it started, where, you know, I'm literally in David Letterman's office watching the top 10 list be written and all that. And, uh, and I just like, it's weird. Like when you're in Florida, like I was the idea of being a, uh, a, a humor, a, a TV writer or any kind of writer is seems so crazy and so out there that like people would laugh at me. You know, my parents were like, what are you talking about? You know, you're going to be like a, a graphic design guy, maybe, you know, <laughs> you know, or whatever. You're never going to leave the state. Um, but once you get out there, it's not it's not that different than anything else. It's just a job, you know. So it's like that was where I realized, oh, I can do this. You just have to kind of put it on the line a little bit. And after uh, New York, after that internship ended, I just packed all my shit in my car and drove to LA um, with, I think a thousand dollars to my name. I rented a little tiny windowless apartment and uh, I bought a mattress at a garage sale and just went for it and just found it and uh, found a PA job. Um, but I knew what I wanted to do. So I became a production assistant on news radio uh, on the set. So I was just the guy on set when they were shooting, answering the phone and getting the actors coffee and stuff. And then, from that position, you just start to chisel away. You start to meet people. Um, but the biggest part of it was a writer writes, you know? So as long as you're writing, I was writing. So it's like, if you have a script and you have something you're proud of, all you gotta do is put yourself in the position of having somebody to beg to read it. And, and that's what I just started doing. And it didn't really go anywhere for years. Um, and then finally news radio kind of said, oh, we liked one of the ideas you said the other day. So we'll give you a story credit on this episode and that you know it was a little bit of money but it was a uh, it was at least a, a sign that i could do it you know yeah I, I i totally get what you're saying about florida constantly being a reminder that your dreams are pipe dreams because whenever i tell anybody that i do anything film related or they see me with a camera the first question is you do porno 
Is that what you're doing? Like, you yeah. can't possibly fathom the idea that, no, I'm actually, I'm trying to do a feature film in, uh, on the first coast. That doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. But the, the car, you mentioned you wanted to be a cartoonist. I know we're, we're, we'll get into Coffee Town more, but um, is that where the cartoon element in Coffee Town came from? It is. It is. Uh, Coffee Town was somewhat of a kitchen sink of an idea of like all the little parts of me that I kind of wanted to fill in and, you know, breaking the, the rules. I mean, nobody else would write a movie with a fucking rad bike freestyle sequence. You know, it was just like, it was just all a little well, thing. I'm like, oh, let's do this. In fairness, they were they were on MDMA. So anything happens at that point from what I've read. So anything could happen at that point. <laughs> exactly, I, I exactly. was I was going to ask, okay, so like you say, um, you, you wanted to be a cartoonist and, and still part of me feels like that's still a joy for you. Clearly, that's something you may do in your free time, spare time, because you still love animating, doing those things. Let me ask you this. So for aspiring writers out there who want to be writers, can you talk to them about because you kind of just spoke to it saying you just got to get out there and go. What is it like? Like you say, to just just have to keep writing, keep writing because you, you become so powerful. People, everyone says they want to write. They write something, they don't finish. Oh man, I'm just looking for that that motivation. I just need something. But you've continued to write and become such a big voice in television. What would your advice be for any aspiring writers out there? I think it's my advice is kind of finish the game because it feels like a, a lot of people write and then they just give up, you know, or, or you know, or in a lot of it, it comes in two sequences. One, they give up on the actual script they wrote because it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, but that's fine. Then you write another script. You know what I mean? It's like they get to that first thing and they're like, I wrote this movie or I wrote this short and I, I even I made it or I didn't make it. It just nothing happened. So fuck it. You know, this town is broken or, or you know, I'm not. Then you just got to keep doing it. Uh, you know, that's the one version. The other version is they just don't even finish the script, <laughs> you know, and those people like if you're not hungry, if you can't get the obstacles out of your way you're never going to make it out here because it is brutal or anywhere. I think, I mean, it's, it's the pandemic has created even a more uh, open, you know, global opportunity. You don't have to be out here to be a writer anymore. Like, you know, we've proved proven now that you don't have to sell things in person. You don't have to be in rooms on in person. Um, we're shooting movies everywhere. That's always been the case. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's about, it's really about absorbing that failure. And I failed over and over. And even when it seemed like uh, you get a little traction and like, oh, people like this script, then it dies. Uh, and you literally have to write another one. You know, I, my to get a TV job, I didn't get a TV job. Like news radio was a gift where they let me write that episode, but they never gave me a, a writing job. And the people, when that show got canceled, they didn't, the people that I met there didn't care enough about me to hire me on other shows. It was a very, it was a very uh, Harvard Lampoon staff. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but the, the TV in that day uh, was very much populated by Harvard Lampoon writers. So kids that were dropouts at the University of Florida didn't get uh, the same look. So that still didn't help me. So I had to, so I truly had to write three or four sample scripts just to get people to read it just to get my first actual staff job and uh so yeah so you just really have to absorb over and over a kick in the gut of failure it's fun <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it builds character um the the news radio the the whole journey of that show is very interesting to me so i wanted to ask I know that you know well phil hartman tragically taken from us in 1998 and I know that news radio was worked was reworked quite, uh, quite a bit after his de unexpected departure. Um, they brought on John Lovitz in an attempt to fill the void. Was uh, was that around the time that you came on? And can you tell us what that experience was like on set, joining the crew during that turbulent time? Yeah, that, I was there the last two years, uh, <clears throat> so it's exactly when all that happened, and it was awful. <laughs> it was even the first year when. Phil was super nice to me because I was a, a drawing design major in college and Phil was actually a graphic design guy. So Phil would just draw all day. Like he had a desk blotter <clears throat> on the set, you know, where his actual desk was and he would just doodle between takes and stuff. I'm really a gifted artist. He's just the nicest guy in the world. And uh, back then you're just looking for kindness wherever you can find it. And Phil was nice and David Foley was unbelievably kind. Andy Dick was strung out and stuff but he was still really sweet and funny everyone it was it wasn't a a group of actors that uh were any they, they were just nice people uh so 
it, it even started with tragedy on, on, on that first year I was there because Chris Farley was always on set and hanging out. And so I was there when the news of Chris died got to Phil because uh, because I'm there answering phones, the rumors, you know, this is before everyone had a cell phone, you know, a smartphone looking down. Um, so the news kind of hit and he looked over to me and the phone rang and it was the producer saying, it's true, you know, Chris Farley's died. And it was just like already it, we were falling apart that year. And that was obviously that was like a son to fill. Uh, and then when he died, it, it was just horrible. It was the worst thing I've ever felt out here. Cause it was just, it felt like so unreal. Like he was a nice guy's wife. I'd met him a bunch of kids. They all just seemed normal and nice and uh, no one saw it coming. It wasn't like a, a, you know, an angry relationship or anything. So it was brutal. So the John Lovitz season, it just felt like, it, honestly it felt like the nail in the coffin we were just waiting for the final shoe to drop i think the show had been moved around so much it wasn't really a hit even though it was a great show yeah so it, it was really sad yeah that that was a that was a crazy time it was around the time like they had john candy and chris mm -hmm. farley and phil hartman i don't know like from an outsider's perspective chris farley was such a shock to me because i only knew him you know he was in pg-13 films uh, the puppy dog comedian, kind of like the lovable character always. And to find out that there was this dark side mm -hmm. and, uh, and to find that out at the time of his death was shocking. And Phil Hartman was just that, that was just mind blowing that, that something so incredible, incredibly tragic could happen to somebody that you just, you kind of look up as like the father figure of comedy. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So the uh, this this is like a selfish question for me because uh i know joe rogan is on news radio i am a huge fan of the joe rogan experience his podcast um which check it out because he needs the viewers um <laughs> i'm just curious if you work directly with uh joe rogan and what what he was like in person he was nice i think yeah i worked with all those guys he was he was funny to me. Uh, by the way, did you know he wasn't uh, the original cast in the news radio was Ray, Ray Romano in that role. Pilot had Ray Romano uh, as that guy and they didn't like him. So they fired him and cast Joe Rogan. But everybody uh, loves Raymond. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that, was, that was easy. That was too easy. Uh, it, was, he, it was funny because Joe was Joe's joke always, you know, he was, he was kind of the loudest and craziest because he was purely like just a stand-up kind of guy but he was still doing all the kickboxing and stuff back then in ufc he was always saying i want to just do a show where it's just called joe gets paid he's like i just want to get paid you know, whatever uh and then when fear factor happened he was like i did it i got joe just gets paid or whatever uh i don't think anyone saw the podcast coming but it's perfect for him but he i mean he, it's 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 almost like he finally found the platform that's exactly who he is and, and what's he what he needs so so it was great to see that uh trajectory because there were moments like i saw him over the years like i saw him at laugh factory you know the stand-up place here and he was just a guy kind of still doing comedy and, and you know doing stand-up and making a living but i don't think like anything at you know not making a giant living and it was kind of like there's not a lot of opportunities at least back then for comedians like joe rogan if you're not at the dane cook level where you're filling you know college towns and stuff like that so it was it's it's nice that he found something that is absolutely his voice and his personality and people are really enjoying it. it's just it's joe gets paid <laughs> paid for his yeah, yeah. personality yeah joe uh joe visited the, uh, the laugh factory one time with uh to talk to uh mr messina the mind of messina oh uh, yeah yeah, yeah so that, that, that happened a little bit. that's a story for another day um uh, listen in 2001 i was that i graduated high school and of course that my mom couldn't ground me anymore but around the time i stopped being grounded between 2001 2003 you worked on a show clearly called the wrote for a show grounded for life this was this your first time being a staff uh basically being a staff writer right or and what was that experience like that experience was my yeah that was my first job really that was uh two guys uh that created that show uh bill martin and mike schiff just read my script i didn't it was the first time where something truly good happened to me uh where i felt like i had broken the curse because i was still a single white guy and even back then it's hard to you know staff writers are the cheapest position on staff uh and staffs still to this day aren't as diverse as they need to be um so what happens is when you get to the cheaper, you know, staff positions, they're like, great, let's get as many you know, diverse people as we can. So it's really hard to break in. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, 
but these guys read my script and just brought me in and just purely out of nowhere. They're just like, we love this script. I had written a Malcolm in the Middle sample. And ah. I got a job. And it was crazy. I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. I had the, I didn't find out I was I had snuck onto the lot at Universal Studios. Like you can go through the back lot and then get into the theme park. So I was at the theme park um, that I'd snuck into when the call came. It was just mind blowing. Uh, yeah, so that was my first job and it was amazing. It was my only multi-camera job where I was there, you know, where we had a live up studio audience on Friday nights. Uh, so I learned every, well, I guess news radio was the same, but my only multi-camera as a writer where you're literally huddled there coming up with jokes in between takes and stuff, which was really fun. Uh, I got used to the hours, you know, that the, a writer works some nights till midnight, two in the morning, whatever you just have to, cause you have to shoot a show. So, uh, you know, that was kind of the trial by fire of, of here's what it's going to take. Uh, but it was, it was great. And I did that for three years. And I love that show. It, and then that was also the last days of Carsey Warner of, of independent studios before the networks could own their own studios. There were independent studios like Carson Warner, which is where Roseanne and, you know, Cosby show and all that stuff came from. So I got to kind of just get a little taste of the last great days of television, Hollywood, independent studios. And now it's gone forever. Like now it's all just yeah. purely, you know, CBS studios, 20th century owned by Fox, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. it's a world. Gone with Roseanne and Cosby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go figure. Um, yeah. 2003 to 2005, you took on the role of producer for the first time on Arrested Development, um, another show like News Radio that was almost loved too late. Like they were too far ahead of their time and it took audiences a while to catch up. Um, yeah. And Arrested Development is one of my, it, it, it's such an amazing show. The the writing and the, the characters is fantastic. Um, was producing always a part of your plan or was that something that that you had not considered and the opportunity just kind of came up you know well here's how it works because it's not really producing isn't really different than being a writer like the, the, the truth is like when a writer goes through the progressions of staff you know staff writer story editor executive story editor producer co-producer supervising producer executive producer you're doing essentially the same thing the i you're uh, just a writer it's just your rank basically but the idea is that as you climb the ranks of being a writer, you're given more responsibilities that are producer responsibilities. You're in the editing room. Um, you're you know, dealing with some budget stuff. You're dealing uh, with hiring directors and hiring, you know, casting it and stuff like that. So it, it doesn't really happen like instantly. You know, you don't become producer or and then all of a sudden you're, you're just like bit by bit. But even as a staff writer, I was being sent to the editing room uh, to, to help edit just cause I was kind of, it was kind of something I was good at. Uh, and then as a showrunner later down the road, I, I sniffed out the writers that had, that were good at other things like editing or casting or whatever. And I'm like, you go to casting, you go editing or whatever. So it's a natural transition. So it doesn't really change over when you become producer. It's just, you get paid a little more, honestly. <laughs> That's funny to hear. I, w I wasn't sure if it was kind of similar to because then I like in the independent film world, the, the lower independent film world where we're at, we the when you start getting into the producer credits, the definitions become really loose as far as from film to film, what a producer means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it flips in film, you know, because an executive producer in a film is less powerful than a producer. But it's flipped in TV. The executive producer is usually the showrunner. And then there's non-writing executive producers whose name is just on there to kind of oversee it and stuff. It's crazy. Sure. Let me let me ask you this, because we're both fans of Arrested Development. Um, like a lot of characters that people resonate towards to that show. Was there a particular character who you had fun writing for or just... Oh, I can already see. Yep, there's. <laughs> uh, Job. Job was my guy. Like Job, uh, Will Arnett. I was a big, and still am, a big Magic fan. Uh, so when I... I, I loved all those characters, but Job, uh, I have two older brothers. One is actually in Jacksonville, uh, two, two uh, soldier brothers, actually. Uh, it's based, Job has a lot uh, of both my older brothers in him, just the kind of swagger. And uh, yeah, I, I loved, uh, that's why like, if you look at the credits of the episodes, a lot of the magic based ones, like sort of Destiny stuff are the ones I wrote that they handed to me. Um, I was the guy like the, the, the very first time we, he had to be a magician, uh, pitched uh, Final Countdown as, as the theme and said, let's put him in leather pants and all that kind of stuff. Cause they were, they didn't really know how would he perform 
And I'm like, this is how, this is how it is. You know, he's got to have this cheesy song and dance around with a knife in his mouth and stuff. Uh, and I just, yeah. So I just really felt that vibe of who, who he was. And that was always the, the one uh, I had the most fun writing. Will Arnett commits so fully to the, that like boastful, arrogant type of character that is so fun to just yeah. like, you're rooting for him to fail because the failure, you know, is just going to be so funny <laughs> the way he takes yeah. and it'll, the failure will probably go over his head. He does, he's not even affected by the failure. Nope. He, it just, it just goes right off him. He's too. <laughs> Let me let me ask you a question. When you sit down to write, and it may be different, or maybe it's the same process, whether it's you know writing for for a sketch show, comedy, just even writing for stuff personally. What's that process like? Clearly, it comes from your mind. You put it out, or you just sit there, get to the computer, and go. What, what is the process like for you to get it going? You know, I I have three stages. I have the kind of the brainstorming stage, which is first, where you just get a legal pad and you come up with a basic shape and ideas, and you just kind of it's just purely open thought, right? Like if you come up with a line of dialogue that makes you laugh, you write it down. If you come up with a character or like some eccentric thing or just something that's random, it's just purely brainstorming, no limits. Then from that, I, st I go to the next phase, which is an outline and I come up with the shape. And that, that truly is, it's kind of the most important step because if you don't have the shape of the story, if you don't know where you're ending, that's where you can hit, you know, a wall when you're in the third stage, which is writing. If you don't know where you're going, and it's, it's amazing how many people just say, I'm going to write the script. I have an idea. You know, it's going to be about two guys hosting a podcast and they just start writing. And then you get to the middle and you don't know where you go. And then you just bail. Like, it's just, you're like, ah, it. you know what I mean? Uh, but if you know where it's going to end, if you know that last moment, that last scene, you're just, you make yourself get there. Cause you're so excited to kind of close up the, close up the draft. Um, yeah, so that that's my process. A lot of people have different processes, but that that's that's definitely how I do it. I have a I have a climax a climax that I keep in my back pocket for if I ever run into that. I haven't run into it yet where I get into the third act and I don't know where it's going to go. But if I ever do get into that, the I'm I'm just going to have it abruptly end with Jesus coming back. I don't care what's <laughs> happening in the story. Trumpets are going to go off. Jesus is going to come down from the clouds and now it's a religious film. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Fail safe. Good fail safe. Ending a lot. Waiting for. Around 2006, 2007, you ventured into film, um, writing Wild Hogs with Tim Allen, Martin Lawrence, John Travolta. Uh, since then, you also wrote Yogi Bear. Around 2010, uh, you did uh, Ferdinand. Um, oh, nice. That's great. <laughs> uh, 2019, Spies in Disguise. And then, of course, in 2013, uh, Coffee Town. When I'm looking at the list, uh, at least in your feature films, um, one of these things are not like the others. Like, Coffee Town is, is definitely... Like, I would never assume that the guy that wrote and directed Coffee Town also did Wild Hogs, Ferdinand, Yogi Bear. And I guess when I wrote the questions, I, I didn't think about the fact that you were becoming a father. So I didn't know if maybe that had something to do with the shift, kind of like the uh, the Eddie yeah. Murphy effect. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is kind of the natural progression of my life. Uh, you know, I pitched Wild Hogs when I was in my 20s. Um, and it was based, based on my dad, you know, like, like my dad in Florida, who didn't have a Harley at the time, but he always wanted one. But it was, it was about looking around at Daytona Bike Week and being like, oh, these guys, these aren't Hells Angels. These are old men that are doctors and stuff, you know? Uh, <laughs> So I didn't really have kids. I didn't have kids uh, when I wrote Wild Hogs. Uh, so that was kind of where I was going. And then I had kids and I definitely got interested in just storytelling and got into the animated thing. And Ferdinand was a book I always loved. Um, and Ferdinand I kind of lucked into because I thought Disney had it uh, because Disney made the Silly Symphony or Merry Melodies or whatever it was, you know, like in the 50s, they did a little Ferdinand short. Mm -hmm. uh, and I called Disney and by the, I was doing a blue sky animation movie at the time I was helping on Rio, Rio two, I think. And I called Disney. I'm like, I, I want to write Ferdinand. Where's Ferdinand? Who has Ferdinand? And they said, we sold it to Fox, but animation is very, very secret. So I called Fox and who I was working for at the time. I said, do you guys have aunt Ferdinand? And they got really quiet and they're like, yeah, we, we, we do. Do you want it? You know, so they had just been sitting on it secretly. Uh, so I came over to that, but the, all of, so the, I, I started on that animation run 
and if and if still on it uh i wrote a movie you know uh that's coming out in a couple of years uh so spies just came out uh last christmas and then yeah the one I, and the next one comes out in 2024 uh so my kids now are 12 and 7 and they love it but animation is also just a fun medium to play around in because you can just do whatever you want uh you know no there's no budget you know you can't there's no one selling saying that will smith can't turn into a pigeon <laughs> you know but if you got that in, into live action you could just you know so it's nice to have no rules um but my heart truly lies like more in the dark comedy weird stuff uh it's just not as profitable and it's not a, an e as easy of a way to make a living uh but coffee town was very much that arrest development uh was very much that and uh and then i'm i have a movie that i'm uh, going to direct here, I think in the next couple of years, uh, a horror comedy that's very, very close to my heart. And that's something I'm definitely into. That's the next big step for me. So very awesome. cool. Yeah. That'll be great. Um, yeah. Awesome. Now, and of course in 2006, 2007, you got a chance to collaborate with a gentleman by the name of Greg Garcia. You were, you know, doing the writing and producing. And, and of course he's the creator of the show. Uh, my name is Earl. And I will say this for me, um, a true testament, I remember being younger and just stuff just coming on TV. And if it's an environment that I'm not used to, but it can bring me in, it's just like writers are the, like, I feel like you guys are somewhat those announcers on the radio. Like you have to build a scene. It has to make me feel like, even though I don't live there, I feel like this is exactly what's happening. It's not a bias thing. Like if I walk to this place right now, this is exactly happening. So I wanted to know what was it like for you to write on that show? Where did you draw your influence from? And also, of course, um, Garcia is so underrated in what he's done and people don't know about, of course, Raising Hope. They, we talk about that. He has such a unique approach to comedy. What was it like working with him in that whole process? It was good. I, I think it was honestly, for me, My Name is Girl was probably the, the most strain I've had on a staff between me and Greg and, and the other people. But Greg is a genius. He's a smart guy. He's a funny guy. Um, he's really loyal. And what happened on that show was he, he had some people that he had brought over from his previous show, Yes Gear, um, that had uh, a different sensibility. That, that, and so when I went into My Name is Earl, I went in uh, with my friend Barbie Adler, who was a, a writer on Arrested Development with me, with the idea that that would be another Arrested Development that would have that edge. And I think it did, but there was a... a an element in the room of people that didn't want that, that wanted the the more the, the kind of yes gear. Like it just, people that I didn't see as uh, the same tone of comedy. So I think there was always a little bit of this, you know? So I think after two years, I left My Name is Earl because of that. But it was never Greg. Greg wasn't in the room that much. Greg was off, you know, when you do a single camera like that, you the showrunner is often on set all the time. Um, so Greg was on the set and the, Greg wasn't running the the room where we cranked out the scripts. He was just kind of send back things circled and say, you know, beat this or change this. Uh, but he's great. He's great. And I still see him often uh, at different things. He's a big survivor on CBS, big survivor fan like I am. <laughs> so we always see each other at the survivor finale. He's like, Hey, um, but he's a genius. He truly is. He, he's just uh, he's just a genius, smart, funny guy that, that I think you're going to see a lot more out of. He, he's he's like me where he always has several things going at once and in development. So, yeah, my yeah. name is Earl is one of the first shows I remember watching where I felt like I was watching a movie every week. Like it came with that kind of production quality, yeah. the, the single camera. the mm -hmm. uh, And I think uh, what you're saying about the people on the team that wanted it to be that wanted to kind of take the edge off of it i can definitely see that in the show because there was this there was this tone kind shift. of not, not really a tone shift but they but there was there what they'd had its edgy moments where you could tell that the writers that were fighting for that one that that bet and then there's the, the, the yeah uh but i think it worked for that show because it, it had a very it's very positive feeling um while still being edgy at times and be like, what the hell? I can't believe they just did that on television. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We noticed a uh, break in television from 2007 to 2013 uh, before you returned with the in-betweeners uh, that the show you developed and executive produced. Was that break in writing in relation to the writer's strike that was happening around that time? Yeah, I think it was. It was a combination of the writer's strike and... Uh, I had a deal at 20th Century Fox, which is when I was on My Name is Earl. So when that deal expired, um, I got heavy into 
the movie stuff. It just, it, the timing worked out. I think Wild Hogs came out right at the end of my tenure on, on, uh, on my name is Earl. So I had to write Wild Hogs 2. Uh, so that was a big commitment because they were going to make that movie. Um, and it's, and I believe I was on an exclusive deal with Disney to write movies uh, because it, I think it's during that time that I wrote Eastbound and the first season of Eastbound and Down, I helped them, but uncredited. So you won't see that on IMDb because I could, I wasn't allowed to take a credit because I was on a <laughs> deal with Disney. Uh, Cause I can remember sitting in the room with Danny McBride and those guys uh, talking about Wild Hogs 2 and then making fun of me for it. There was actually a point, there was a great moment at uh, Funny or Die are the guys that made Eastbound that we went for a meeting over at funnyordie.com at their offices, uh, at, or I guess it was Gary Sanchez Productions or whatever. And on the wall, the Funny or Die writers had made a list of the worst sequels of all time. <laughs> and one of them was Wild Hogs 2, even though it hadn't been made. And Danny McBride just started laughing. He's like, oh my God. He's like, that's Brad's writing that movie right now or whatever. And I, like, they were all embarrassed. Like the Funny or Die people were like embarrassed. But I'm like, I was laughing. I'm like, I get it. Like, whatever. It's like, I, I didn't direct Wild Hogs. It is what it is. Um, and then they erased it. Then I went back the next day and it had been erased. I'm like, why did you erase it? Don't be, I'm not that guy. Like, who cares? Put it back up there. It's funny. If it's funny, it's funny. Um, right. But yeah, so I did, I, I was definitely in movies for a while there and I had some good momentum. And then it just got depressing because Wild Hogs 2 went down uh, because the the Dick Cook, the head of the studio got fired. And so they kind of got rid of all the all the Touchstone movies completely. And they're just like, let's just do branded Disney comedy, which is fine. Did you, around the time of that writer's strike, do you notice any similarities between that time and what's happening now with the, the COVID-19 pandemic? there's the same sadness of writers out of work. That's the hardest part. Um, yeah. I've been really lucky because I'm doing animation, at least right now in animation uh, you can do without a product, you know, without a set. So we're, I'm still working. A lot of people are kind of working just through zoom rooms and stuff, but there's a lot of out of work people. And, you know, you get a lot of friends out here. Every staff is 18 people or so. And you carry those friends with you from show to show and you, before you know it, you have 300 people in your life that you care about, you know, grips and all those people. Uh, and now I know about the suffering, you know, through social media and Facebook and, and just word of mouth, you hear people. And then, you know, I, I get at least a three or four texts a day of, Hey, you know, if you hear of any work, let me know. And it's just, it's hard. It's really hard because you just want everyone to get out of it. Um, and I think once we get the vaccine here, it'll come out, but the strike was the same thing. People were getting, destroyed in the strike financially just truly like destroyed wow all right that, those are these are tough times i'll say like you say uh yeah definitely tough times let, let me ask this we've talked about of course your writing talked and uh we talked about that we've also talked about you doing uh, producing as well but i want to say with the in-betweeners of course you started handling the beginning stages of of the development like as far as laying the foundation could you talk what, what was that like because now i always tell people this if you're going to make it in hollywood or film you need to know how to do multiple things it's like being on the golf course you don't take one club you got to have several different things you're doing can you talk about how yeah. you feel about you know laying the foundation and now adding that to your repertoire at that time of things that you were doing yeah, I mean, in betweeners was the first thing where I had complete control, uh, and I failed. <laughs> you know, the in betweeners did not get picked up for second season, but not by any doings of me. I think it was just because MTV has a, a female audience and it was a very male oriented show. But the uh, in betweeners, the reason I came back to TV was they they had this show. Um, they had no script, but it was already greenlit, and they were just desperate to make it. And I was a big fan of the British original, so I went to MTV. And I had two big caveats. One was I wanted to shoot in Florida because I wanted to bring jobs back to Orlando. Um, so I said, you have to let me shoot this in Florida. And you could tell them kind of balk, like what? And, you know, uh, and the second was, I said, there's this director that, that I know you guys don't know that nobody knows. And I want you to let him be my director. And that was Taika Waititi. Uh, hmm. And again, MTV was like, what? Who in Taika came in and, you know, long hair, crazy looking New Zealand guy. Um, and they just thought I was insane. They had never seen anything he had done because it was all New Zealand based at that point, but I knew who he was and I had seen his stuff. Um, so they agreed. So I got to shoot in betweeners in Orlando, Universal Studios Orlando with Taika. We lived uh, in Orlando together for six months doing that. And it was, an, it was really cool because we got to do purely what we wanted with that show. 
um, with a very limited budget. Um, and uh, so at the end of the day, it was really satisfying and really fun. Uh, but again, like when I say there's like heartbreak in this town, you know, they told us all all along, um, try, try to make it uh, as female oriented as you can, because you're going to go on after Awkward. And Awkward was MTV's big hit at the time. And we kind of halfway met, you know, met them halfway and put some, a lot of romance storylines in there, whatever. But then when it was all wrapped and we had these 13 episodes, some that I thought were really funny, they said, it's still too male oriented. So we're going to put it on after this ridiculousness thing. And I, I knew instantly we were done because I was like, I, I've seen ridiculousness. I know ridiculousness. It's, it's funny, but it's, you know, it's America's Funniest Home Videos or Tosh or whatever. It's no one wants to watch that and then go into a scripted voiceover right. narrative show. Like that right. one, you want to just get high and laugh at people falling off skateboards. You can't make that transition. You can do that one after in-betweeners. Mm-hmm. And MTV just didn't care. They were just like, whatever. And then they put it on there and it failed. I mean, it did okay. But, and then the guy, David Janelari, who was running MTV got fired. And the next person came on board and the first thing they did was kill in-betweeners. So it was, it was sad. Uh, and then they had like the audacity, like in shows after to call MTV would call and say, Hey, can you get Taika to, to, you know, answer our calls to direct this other thing? And I'm like, Fuck you guys, you didn't even want Taika. I had to beg you, <laughs> I had to beg you <laughs> to get Taika. There you go. And that's yeah. by the way, that, that just as a weird offshoot with Taika. That's happened my whole life. Like Taika was living with me when he was getting ready to direct Thor or whatever. But at that time he was just doing a hunt for the wilder people. And he, we talked about Knight Rider and he knew it, I had uh, written it and he's like, oh, Mike, man, I'd love to do that. Can I, can I get the script? And I would, and I called uh, the Weinstein people and I'm like, my friend Taika, he's, he's a New Zealand director. He's going to be huge. He's doing this, what we do in the shadows thing right now. Can he have the script to Knight Rider? And they're like, no, we're not giving it to Taika. Who's this guy? And then lo and behold, two years later, you know, hey, will Taika read Knight Rider? No, he's done now. He's on Thor. You can't get him anymore. It's just like, People in this town are just so dumb. No one has any imagination. I, I heard Taika is actually directing Couples Retreat Part Two. Yeah, this. Is- <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. Taika's actually. I don't know if you noticed. Taika is in Coffee Town when uh, Glenn Howerton is getting his hair cut at the school in the early scene. Taika is the uh, guy. Is the the store or whatever the the. Teacher. Don't be afraid to don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> Wait, oh my yeah. god, I didn't even notice that, yeah. man. Just... That's awesome. That's psychic. He was on set with me. I'm like, come play this guy. <laughs> just jump in there. He's like, it was it was funny because it was like, oh, I don't have a visa. I'm like, yeah, who cares? This is just a stupid movie. Just get in there. <laughs> Speaking of uh, people you know being in Coffee Town, I noticed when I did the rewatch last night for the show, uh, Oliver Copeland, the boy. Yeah. That's your is that your son? That's my son. Yep. He was, they, you know, they, uh, they told me he was such a sweet, he's 12 now and grumpy and weird as that happens, but the, uh, uh, he's a great kid. But back then they're like kids this young have a real time, like not looking at the camera and stuff like that. And I'm like, trust me, he's got it. And he was perfect. He was, he was good. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, that's a perfect segue. So yeah, we're in 2013 coffee town. I discovered coffee town cause I'm a huge uh, always sunny fan and um just 10 episodes every 365 days is not nearly enough time uh f- for glenn howerton to be in my life so i was i was desperate to find something else that he was in and that led me to coffee town and i swear within five the first five minutes of the movie i didn't care if, if glenn howerton died and it was he was no longer in it was just such a all the characters in it are so great um perfectly nuanced characters the writings fresh and quirky i mean the jokes are like it's like a joke every 30 you seconds can't keep up. it's you insane can't keep up. um and every joke is fresh and quirky and you get it, that like what i love about coffee town is that you don't there there's a lot of times where like the the joke about aids uh, that that comes back like it's not just a joke for a joke about AIDS. He uses that as a device to get the next roommate out, and mm-hmm. then kind of like the jokes surrounding um, Down syndrome, that comes where you oh, know at, at the robbery, full circle, uh, all, all the way to the 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 one of the most hilarious moments when he's when he lets people in the, when Will lets people in the uh, in the door before him, and they cut him in line, and he makes the choice later <laughs> on to 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 not put up with that shit anymore. 
and ends up getting shot. So like the jokes aren't even just just rapid fire jokes for the sake of being funny. They come back again and Call pay that. off. Um, so it's just so excellently written. It reminded me of of Office Space the way you can you have like a a finger so on such unique nuances about different people that mm -hmm. like we all know in some way and that's what's so funny about it um so yeah i mean i, I could just keep going so where where uh -huh. did the i know you said that that was kind of like a, a hodgepodge of different things that you were thinking of and and just you know put in put like a frankenstein of uh, ideas that you've had throughout the years but um like, wh how did you flesh that out? Like, where did the idea in general come from? Um, it was like a decade of, yeah, little ideas that had been, you know, the, the concept existed from the moment I saw people on their laptops in <clears throat> Starbucks. I was like, oh, I want to tell that story. So then when you have the concept in your head, I just started gathering pieces year after year and kind of writing them down in a little spiral notebook. Like, for instance, the holding the door open happened. Uh, it, was actually, it was actually Ashton Kutcher. I was at a Starbucks here in Sherman Oaks and I opened the door. Uh, so Ashton was behind me and I opened the door. I'm like, Hey man, and I don't know him or whatever. And he just like, he's like, Oh, thanks. And he like walked in. I was just being nice. And then he got in line. I'm like, I was clearly ahead of you. And I opened the line for you, dude. Like you should be letting me in line ahead of you. It was just like, so that I went home and I wrote that down. You know, it's like all those little things kept adding into it. Uh, so yeah, I just started collecting all these ideas and all these concepts and then I just wrote the script. I just wrote it really fast. And I, it was the easiest front side of a project I've ever had. I gave it to my agent who was getting on a plane um, to New York. And I said, I just wrote this thing to direct. It's really small. It's a couple million dollars. And he got off the plane. He called me and he said, it's great. I gave it to Ricky Van Veen at collegehumor.com. And Ricky wants to make it. They're just they'll just fund it you don't have to go anywhere else you're done and I was like what <laughs> like I was literally thinking I was going to get uh you know he was going to catch some grammar mistakes and we were going to rewrite it for you know a month and go back and forth and then we'd go out to the town it was just all done and I literally so that script was greenlit with literally a ton of spelling errors and off the very first draft so yeah and, and then we just went and there was the cast just came together really naturally um the first guy I met for the lead was actually Chris O'Dowd uh and then like he was right but not perfect and, and I think there were some scheduling issues and then we heard that Glenn was interested so I sat down with Glenn and I'm like this is just perfect it's, he's the perfect guy I always wanted Steve Little for Chad uh on my East Mountain Down days of just like uh he's just so funny and I, I and still to this day I feel he is so underused. He's so funny. And it's like, he should be everywhere. And he really isn't. He just kind of just works and does his thing. Um, and then Ben, Ben was for, uh, Ben, we read uh, Schwartz. We read for the barista. And he's like, <clears throat> I don't want to play the barista. Like, I don't, I'm not, he's like, I don't want to be the guy. He's like, I want to be the cop. I'm like, what? Like the cop was going to be Damon Wayans Jr. And hit Damon Wayans had read for it and wanted to do it. Uh, and he, Ben just wanted it so bad. And I was like, well, if he wants it that bad, let's just do it. Like, and uh, so Ben became the cop. And then uh, Josh Groban reached out to be the barista. And I was like, what? Like Josh Groban, he's a singer. And they're like, well, you just, will you just meet with him? And uh, I'm like, yeah, of course. I'm Josh Groban. Who wouldn't want to like go have coffee with Josh Groban? How fun is that? And he was just the sweetest, sweetest guy in the world. And he, he was so honest. He's like, I want to do this. I'll read, like I'll, I'll, I'll audition. And I'm like, what? All right. And so him and he, we went to uh, the uh, Sunny in Philadelphia offices and he read with Glenn. We did like a little chemistry read and we knew instantly, uh, even Glenn knew. He's like, this is great. Like this guy, this, like it's going to be such a great interplay. Um, so yeah, it all just came together really organically and then we just went off and then all the other little pieces there's people in there like jake johnson and matt walsh plays a cop at the end there's just people in there that are like became all these there were just all the comedy people i loved uh and they were just it was crazy they were just willing to do it like, which is still astonishing to this day <laughs> i'm like really jake that's johnson what, is willing to come out and play this part that's what we were going to ask we were, me and him were discussing this the other day we were like each character like you said sometimes it's a perfect mess of where the the script 
meets the characters and that everybody buys in. So what we, me and him were wondering, did you write with specific people in mind or did it just kind of organically happen? Or did you have the best casting director ever? Because, I mean, these guys, you see it on screen. I, I think it's a, little, it's a mixture of both. You know, we had a great casting director, Jewel Beskup, who did a bunch. Of, she did The Hangover. She did Wedding Crashes and stuff like that. And she did Life Pieces with me. Um, but uh, there were there were people that that just came out of the woodwork through the agency. I think what, what was really happening was the script was kind of catching fire and people really liked the idea and they liked the idea of it being this little indie cool movie. And our timing was perfect because those kind of movies were getting just starting to get looked at uh, for online streaming and iTunes and stuff like that. So, yeah, it really truly was a combination of both. Josh Groban was Jules. She's the one that brought it up. Um, Annie Pilecki, Adrian Pilecki was casting. Like they said, she'd be perfect for this. And I'm like, if she's willing to do it, that's great. I love her. She's in Friday Night Lights and she's the best, you know? So yeah, it was, it was truly a combination of both those things. That, that's one of the things I really like about this movie is most comedies in this vein, the, the female in it is usually just there as more like a glorified prop pretty much mm -hmm. they don't really have but she actually she had funny lines and right. and really funny moments right. uh i thought that was that was that was cool i mean she doesn't want guys yeah. to know piss comes out of her let's just make that very clear let's make that very clear. <laughs> she was actually it's it, the uh allison williams was so I look, look at your shirt mr and mrs williams is based off of uh ricky van Dien was the producer who found a college tumor he was married at the time or getting married to Allison Williams, Brian Williams' daughter. Mm -hmm. um, so Allison was on or getting ready to go on Lena Dunham's show on HBO, whatever, whatever that was it called, Girls, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Allison was good. If, if Annie Plecky couldn't do it, uh, Allison was going to be it. But that's why that's what Mr. and Mrs. Williams came from. It's based on Ricky and Allison Williams. Oh, <laughs> very nice. Um, I knew I was in something special when like i think it's like 90 seconds into the movie you have jake johnson running in i have f***ing aids i'm like all right this is a comedy right because right. and then it actually Thanks. successfully like has humor coexist with aids and i never thought that was a possibility and then Derek waters uh character with the sleep condition comes shortly after the uh, <laughs> this <laughs> um and, and then like, uh, where did these, like, I know you, you had the, uh, it seems like a lot of them come from a somewhat personal experience. Um, oh my God, the, uh, you can't get it twice. Like, <laughs> oh, that was it for me. That was like, it. That was it. There's so many great moments that are so pointed. Like, where did, where did these ideas come from? You know, they just, they came from my head. <laughs> I think they just came from my <laughs> twisted sensibility. Some of those jokes, we had a little round table. I think that you can't get it twice came from Jimmy Vallely, who is one of the greatest writers that is in this town. Like he's probably 55, 60 now. Um, he was a writer with me on Arrested Development, but he's been, he was like a Golden Girls writer. He's been around forever. I think he pitched that joke in a little round table we had. When my, uh, when my wife and I were watching it last night, she, that part came on again. She said, oh my God, I forgot about that. That is literally the most disgusting uh, thing ever. <laughs> I was, I was like, that's AIDS, was, that's AIDS phobic. AIDS, it, you know what, what Coffee Town kind of was, was when you're a sitcom writer, you say things in the room that are darker and funnier than could ever be on TV, you know? Um, and that's just it. I mean, I think it's that way just when you're sitting around with your friends joking and laughing, you're like, oh my God, we, no one can say what, what we just said or whatever. And Coffee Town was kind of my, my platform of saying, let's just do all those jokes. Let's like, let's have a, a fight between a down syndrome guy. Let's have, uh, you know, the, the, the gay rant thing, which was, I think I wouldn't even do today back then. Like, I think I would probably cringe if I watched that again. Uh, but, uh, so there were things that were so on the edge that I think they expired, frankly. I think that they, were, they probably crossed the line. I could literally <laughs> feel myself turning black on the inside. <laughs> oh, that is just... <laughs> I don't think that would land. That would be a really hard thing to do right now. That would be a hard joke because everything's so, you know, uh, you know how it is. It's just really hard to, no one wants to take the risk of that kind of thing going viral. But Coffee Town existed in the last moment before things went viral. So we got right. to do all those things. Um, but that's also, I think, one of the reasons that you don't see Coffee Town on Netflix and things like that. I think they watch right. it. 
whoa, no way. <laughs> so. Yeah, and there's it's such a loss too because there's something so much more gratifying about a joke that you that you feel like you shouldn't laugh at compared to a safe joke. It's right. like you could feel a pressure valve being released when something like that happens and Man, there is so much pressure built up now that we could use that pressure yeah. relief and people I, are just afraid to like how do we how do you say something racist without sounding racist like, there's no way to do that there's no way to do that uh what i was going to say the, the genre i came up with it i call it respectfully dark and like i say i still love to see stuff like that because again i feel like comedians are have been stripped of being comedians nowadays. They can no longer be themselves, which completely sucks. But let me ask you this. Uh, we both have directed before, and we talked about it clearly the crescendo to you, your career. Now, you direct Coffee Town, and like you say, it's like a, I guess it's a writer's dream because, again, you, you're you in the room with all these writers, but now everyone's looking at you. So you can't just write. You can't just edit. You can't just put, you're wearing all these hats. What was that experience like? It, it's, it's, it's fun. It's really... Uh... It's, it's a weird thing. There's so much pressure and, but you're so, it takes so much effort to direct as you guys know, there's so many things happening at once that you don't have time to freak out. You just have to go into the mode. I, I think like the best director advice I ever give is just like make a decision, even if it might be wrong. And then later say, Oh yeah, I was wrong. Like that's better than being indecisive in the moment. So there was a lot of that where I'm like, I have no idea, but I'm going to tell you the answer to the question. Like, I know I'm right. And uh, so it, it's like, you don't have time to feel it till almost till afterwards. I think when we were wrapped in and editing, it's just like, oh, then it's a relief of like, Jesus. Um, but Coffee Town was made in 24 days. That is a short amount of time for a big yeah. movie like that. And we had a, a small budget. I think it came out to like 2.3 million or something, but that's, I mean, we built a coffee store and stuff like, so automatically you've lost 500,000 of that right off the bat just to build the, the coffee. Wow. Town. Coffee town was just like studs, you know, it was just nothing. So to build that and to set design it and to decorate it, it's like, then you, you know, you put in the, the money we were paying the cast and all that, like all now you're down to just like $700,000. So it's like, it goes quick. Um, so what, what ended up happening was, we had like two or three takes for each thing. So we couldn't read, we had to just fly. We had to fly. Um, so there was a lot of that and it, it, it was a whirlwind. Wow, that is the opposite of my assumption when I watch it because it, everything feels so organic, like especially all the dialogue in Coffee Town when the three guys are just kind of, it seems like it, when I, it seems like when I watched them, like they, they had to have just a lot of time to play with these moments and, and, figure out you know just try different things but they know there's three takes that's that's great yeah. that kind of answers my question i mean with there's so many um hilarious mini stories happening within this movie from ben schwartz misadventures is the worst cop ever um the <laughs> the, the feud between josh groban's character and glenn howerton's character is just amazing the little nuance about the the, the him not wanting to take the tip um makes me feel like a whore steve that, that, I, think my, I think my favorite part is uh steve little's character where he ends up taking up smoking to get that's actually how i started smoking cigarettes when i was 18 i was working at hollywood video and i noticed that i only got a 30 minute break but the people that smoked got to step out whenever they needed it and I was like, all right, <laughs> I I'm, I'm going to, and I actually started smoking Newports and Black and Milds around that time. So that <laughs> hit Chad's character really smoked. We weren't friends me. back then. We weren't friends back then. Uh, <laughs> um, real but, quick question. Let, let me get side note. I just have to know whose idea was it to give the bomb the tall boy with the roofies? I have to know who idea that was. Say that again? Whose idea was it to give the bomb the tall boy of beer with roofies in it? Oh, my God. I don't even remember. <laughs> I, that, that just took me out. I'm just telling you that, right? Like, so it's okay. We're, like, like you say, respectfully dark. He'll be okay. We just want to sleep for a little while. Just take some roofies and a beer. Here you go. <laughs> and it wasn't enough to hand it to him voluntarily. When he to I, 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 I'm trying to think back. I think there was also like certain rules. Like we, we could do roofies, but we couldn't do other things like to put him to sleep and stuff. Just, oh like, was... So that's why they knock it out of his hand when it actually happens. Like he, he, he knocks it out of his own hand. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, and it's all it's all faint in my memory, but there were definitely rules. Like, yeah, definitely you could show it going that. There still are. I mean, like it's it's there were so many rules that snuck up on us. Yeah. So, was, were, were there any like 
any of the moments that we see on screen or any character developments, was any of that spawned by just so many hilarious people being together on set? Yeah, I, I every every take was between takes. People would come up with little things like like Ben Schwartz came up to me in the first couple of days and he said, "I'm never going to eat anything, but I'm always going to have a muffin in my hand. I'm always going to be smelling it or tasting it." He's like, but I'm mean, never so he did so every time he's, he's like, yeah, he's like sniffing it, but he never eats. He never eats anything. And that's like his quirk. Um, and we came up with all of that stuff. You know, it was just fun, and it was uh, a lot of it was just goofing around between takes because it did take time to set up the shots, obviously. Uh, and then you, it was just magic, and you could tell the, the guys were all friends. There was also like a weird thing where like a lot of them are pretty rich, like like Josh Groban has a ton of money, Glenn Howard has a ton of money. There was like this kind of like, hey, you know, like let's. It was almost like a camp thing. Like no one reason I mentioned that like no one was really out there to make a living. It was more like a bunch of friends making a college film just for the sheer joy of it. Uh, and I think that that's what you see coming through is everyone kind of discovering these fun little things they got to do. And those guys are all still friends. Like they're all, all of us are, but like Ben and, and Groban and uh, Howerton and all those guys are all super tight now from that. I think it really paid off too, because like if you ever stand outside a comedy club, you have, like they are always trying to one up each other. And like with most comedies, you have the funny guy and then everybody else throwing him softballs to hit. And with yeah. this, you have so many funny people on the set. It's like they're sharpening each other every day. Mm -hmm. And you could tell on the screen, like they are oh, like, I can't, I, we are going to pick a favorite character in this episode, yes, we are. but <laughs> it is really, really difficult to, I can't, I like even the, even the people that have a second, like the guy that comes in and starts singing happy birthday behind them. Like, uh, get, get out of here. Get you, out of here. You know better than that. Like everybody shines. Yeah. By the way, that's, that's Josh singing when he actually hits the big note. That's Josh Groban singing. We dubbed wow. it. See, see, I got to go back and watch that part again. I <laughs> yeah, I like, ah, whatever, I'm like, that's, actually, that's Josh, and, Mike, and then we put it in the guy's mouth. Because the funny thing is, we told Josh, we're like, you're in this movie, but you're going to sing terribly, which he does, except the one moment where it's someone else singing, then it's your voice. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane. Uh, one of the things that I think we've been spoiled with in film nowadays, especially with Marvel, uh, Easter eggs. Like there's like 30, 40 Easter eggs. People are looking for things of that nature. Now, of course, we found a, uh, an Easter egg in Coffee Town. Of course, there was a mention and a reference to, of course, Life and Life and Pieces. Flip what? that. Life and Pieces reference Coffee Town. I'm sorry. You know what I mean. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, listen. What's in that water? Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 yes. Yes. So Life and Pieces, uh, of course, reference Coffee Town. Was that your doing, or did someone just do it as a nod to you? How, how did that work out? Yeah, it was 100% me. I was the <laughs> one of my closest friends in the world, Justin Adler, created that show. And uh, yeah, we just got to an episode where we needed a coffee store. I'm like, he's Coffee Town. He's like, well, I'm like, yeah, I'll get the rights, you know, whatever. It's just, I just call Ricky. Um, you know, the cool thing was, we already had all the art, you know what I mean? It's like, it costs money to design that stuff. Um, and I'm like, I'll just get the JPEG of the Coffee Town emblem and we'll just print that up instead of having to come up with a new one. It'll save you a day. Um, but it was really sweet. So when we shot that scene, seeing Colin Hanks and everybody in the Coffee Town stuff was truly, because that was just a few years ago. It was like a little memory lane kind of thing. And I sent the picture to Howerton and all those guys. And they're like, ah, everyone. It was like, it's like, a, it's like the Lord of the Rings guys all getting their tattoos when they, you know, it's like they look back at that time as like the time that forged them as people or whatever. It really does feel like Coffee Town was this moment in time that can't, exist again and will never be allowed to exist like no one will ever be allowed to do the things we did uh right. so yeah it was it's me but that was truly truly a nod to that and a few people caught it the coffee town it has a weird cult following a very good cult following but not as wide as you would think and uh so the people that did see it uh went wild and stuff but it was uh the other people were like, what are you talking about? What is Coffee Town? Did you have a favorite memory from the production, whether it was on screen, off screen with someone? I think we, we shot the, my favorite memory is we shot the uh, outside nighttime stuff at the very end. Um, and it was so cold because uh, that's, we shot, this is in, uh, up in the high desert. We shot, shot this movie uh, in Palmdale. And it was truly like everyone was just punch drunk and weird and funny and we had Matt Walsh there. We had the whole cast. Post Matt Walsh was playing a cop. Um, 
and that was like the greatest weirdest ending of any movie like we were just out of it and having so much fun people were doubling over laughter there was there was a scene where um glenn goes up the ladder on the side of a building to get to the roof where he his feet stick in or whatever so the stunt not even this we didn't have a stunt guy but just like the props guy is like i'm going to show you how to go up this ladder he starts going up the ladder and the ladder comes off the side of the building. <laughs> it's like going like this. And I'm like, thank God. Like he was okay. And he fell, but he was okay. But I'm like, thank God that wasn't Glenn. Like, like if you hadn't <laughs> caught up, like stuff. So all of that just became this crazy whirlwind. I also think the, uh, another highlight is the fight between Ponce, who the Down syndrome actor and uh, Chad, uh, Steve Little. And I told Ponce, Ponce was the sweetest, funniest, nicest guy uh i said and he's like what do i do i'm like just beat him up like just go for it <laughs> just jump all over him. we're gonna have three cameras running and so there's a scene where he like jumps and he just kind of belly flops on him ponce really does that like he really flattens steve little in a few spots and stuff and it was all all the cast was doing it uh like the cast was there they weren't you know only a few people were in that shot but and there every, you could tell the crew and everybody was standing around was like i can't believe we're doing this like we're really watching <laughs> A guy with Down syndrome <laughs> fight another guy, and he's really fighting him. And we're really filming this? Like, it was bizarre. It was bizarre. That that scene had one of the fanta most fantastic literal punchlines, too, and the cook comes out. I, think, I feel like down. that's why they came up he's with that part. Down, down syndrome. syndrome. <laughs> and we tried oh, to get this, this song for that uh, uh, from Karate Kid. We tried yeah. to get uh, uh, you're the best or whatever. It's been used a lot. And we're like, ah, this joke. Has been everywhere. I think even Sunny in Philadelphia used it, um, using that song as a punchline. Mm -hmm. But you, so you have to clear that song with the guy that wrote it, Joe Joe Bean as so Espo Esposito. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Esposito's like, yeah, I clear I clear it all the time. Just give me the pages. He's like, I you know this is how I make my living. I sell this one song to everybody. So send me the pages. And we didn't want to send him the pages because we're like, he's not gonna clear it. Like he's gonna see what this is. And they're like, no, no. He always says yes. He always says yes. We send him the pages, phone rings the next day. No, he's not clearing this song. So the song you hear is a, is a copy. We got the publishing rights to it. It's not him singing it. It's not the exact version from Coffee Down or from uh, Karate Kid. And that's why we couldn't get Joe to sign off on it. That's hilarious. That's, yeah, that is such a, yeah, that is such a great scene. And like, it's a jaw dropping scene. You can't believe it's happening. Like, yeah, it's just fantastic. All right, uh, 2015 to 2019, you executive produced and wrote on Life in Pieces. This is a, another fresh approach to television comedy being served up in short bursts, revolving subplots around the central theme filled with, uh, this is another one with like the jokes per page are insane. Um, having worked so much in comedy, did you notice a difference in the pacing of this show, like uh, in comparison to other comedy shows that you worked on? This, this Life in Pieces was just, uh, the pacing was about the same. Like we, we knew we were doing, the, but the problem with Life in Pieces was telling stories in little snippets, you know, like four stories per episode was a whole new thing. And uh, no one had really done it before. And we discovered there were huge advantages to it because you could be funny and you could like, like uh, the things you pitch that aren't big enough to be a story all of a sudden could be. Uh, which is huge. I mean, at any writer's room, you'll see a million postcards or story cards up on the wall of thoughts and ideas that just never get made because they're not big enough to have three acts, you know? So we got to make all those one little ideas into stories. But there's also a tremendous downside to it. And that when you don't tell one story for the whole half hour, you lose viewers. Like, like, because there's nothing carrying you from one commercial break to the next. And we didn't really think about that <laughs> until we, you know, so it was a, it was a really hard thing to overcome. And I think at the end of the day, we never really fully overcame it. The show did really well, um, but it never became addictive television because you never had that cliffhanger before the commercial break where people stuck with it. You know, the line to a TV show is always like this, at least good ones, you know, that mm -hmm. you build and build and build and build and then it's over. Ours was always just flat. Like we started good and we ended good, but you didn't see any ups and downs. Um, and we never built and we never got uh, 
addictive level television, which is unfortunate because it was a great cast. Definitely. One of the things I noticed about it real quick uh, was the titles. Uh, we, we talked about the title. Of the, the titles were very interesting. So I had to ask uh, who came up with that concept. And of course, how was that even pitched? But that was Justin. That was his idea from the beginning to come up with a word for each story. I, I didn't like it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, thought, I kept saying like, uh, I, I wanted it to be just one word or something where people could remember it. I, I, the reference I always used was like Seinfeld. I'm like, remember the yada, yada, yada episode? People, people can say the yada, yada episode. They can say the soup Nazi episode. They don't, they can't say what these episodes are to their friends or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of a joke within a joke. Uh, but he loved it. It's his show. <laughs> that, like I said, just like the in-betweeners. But it's your show. You can do whatever the hell you want. I like the puzzle aspect of it because you kind of get like you could almost make a game out of guessing what it's going to be about and finding where those where those things came, where the words, the keywords came from. And we got we got to a point where we ran out of words because we never repeated words. So we would get the story like third season. We're like, it's about the girl not wanting to go to sleep. We're like, okay, let's call it bed. No, we've used bed. Okay, let's call it sleep. No, we've used sleep. No, okay, let's call it animal. We've used animal <laughs> so, because we know that's where it's really hard. So the last question I have is you, you recently completed a screenplay for the upcoming film, like you said, coming to Disney plus uh, Flora and Ulysses, um, starring Allison Hannigan, Danny Pudi, uh, Bobby Moynihan, and uh, again, Ben Schwartz. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that? So Flora and Ulysses is based off of a book, uh, the one, the Newberry Medal, three years ago, uh, called Flora and Ulysses. It's about a little girl whose parents are getting divorced. Uh, her dad has moved out. And her dad has an obsession with comic books that he shared with her. So he leaves and her world is just broken. She's this 12 year old girl. And she's like, the movie opens with her throwing her comic books away and giving up. And so the squirrel, she, the squirrel comes into her life, like through an accident in her yard. And it turns out the squirrel has superpowers. So the, it very much becomes like, almost like miracle on 34th street where like this family needs a miracle to pull them all together. And the squirrels is, is the miracle. And it sounds quirky and weird, but it really is just a big family story. It's got a ton of heart. Um, it's live action, but the squirrel is, you know, photorealistic. The squirrel is done by the same people that did Lion King and, you know, uh, the one and only Ivan and all that. Uh, so you can't like the squirrel, it's unbelievable. You can't believe this isn't a real squirrel when you see it, but there was, it's hundred percent digital. Uh, so that, yeah, that'll come out early next year. And it's, it's, it's really fun. It's really great. And we've got a lot of funny people in it. We, one of the fun facts was we have all the ducktails. So Ben Schwartz is a ducktail. Bobby's a ducktail. Daniel Pudi is a ducktail. And then Kate, uh, what's her name? The, 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 is the other duck. So all the ducktails just randomly ended up in our movie. That's, oh, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. Well, listen, <laughs> uh, listen, Brad, uh, what, what I want to say is, of course, to our viewers, I implore you guys to go to IMDb. Look up Mr. Brad Copeland and, of course, watch everything. I mean, whatever he's done, watch it, look over it, it. And, you know, look out for that script that me and him are going to be pitching for you with our petition for Kit Knight Rider. But, uh, and again, you definitely do not disappoint. You've been a great interview. One of the things that we want to say before uh, before we go, with that being said, um, beyond uh, Flora and Ulysses uh, and, of course, on Disney+, Plus, is there anything else they can look out for you that's coming up right now that you want to let us know about other than the sequel to Coffee Town called Brown Town? What else is coming out? <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, 2020 <laughs> needs brown town we need brown town man <laughs> i have two projects that are going to be the next thing you see one is about um one's called jerry and marge go large about a retired couple in michigan that find a way to hack the lottery and this is based on an article that was in the huffington post called jerry and marge go large you know you know you guys should google it have your people it's one of the most interesting stories you'll ever see um, so we wrote that script and that's being assembled uh, with the cast. I can't see who the cast is, but we're putting it together right now. Uh, so that'll be shot. Hopefully I can't say the director, David Frankel, who directed, uh, uh, Devil Wears Prada and Marley and me, uh, who lives down in Miami. Um, great director. Uh, he's going to be directing it. So that's going to go forward. And then I have a, like I said, a horror comedy that's kind of like very close to my heart, just like Coffee Town was. So you'll see that hopefully in the next year and a half i'd say i want to start shooting it this spring summer um but it's very much in the tone of evil dead you know american werewolf in london uh, a horror comedy but a dark scary horror comedy and it's weird and i'm sure you'll see some of your uh some of the coffee town people coming back into Please. it yeah Please. so that's something i'm gonna that that's probably the next big thing i'm i'm doing so you guys will be the first to hear it in the 
some days. Oh, thank oh, you. I am thank sincerely. You. sincerely You've given us so many exclusives today. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to us. It has been an honor and a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Sure, guys. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. Stay safe. Right, thank you. Find us in all these links that's coming up right now.